So far, we have proved the chip shift theorem, which says that pi of x, the number of prime numbers less than or equal to x, is asymptotically x divided by log of x up to a constant. And you may want to ask, with chip shift theorem in hand, how far are we from our ultimate goal of proving the elementary number theorem, which states that these two quantities ratio converge to 1 as x goes to infinity. You might think we are not too far away from this, but unfortunately, the answer is no. Although the proof leading all the way to Chipsev theorem is already very technical. The eventual elementary proof for the prime number theorem is still a lot more involved and technical. And you can see this from the history of the prime number theorem. The Chipsev theorem was established in 1852. But the first elementary proof of the prime number theorem was not obtained until the year 1948. So there is almost a 100 year gap between these two proofs. And you can imagine how many mathematicians have tried very hard to find the elementary proof for the prime number theorem. To give the proof of the prime number theorem in the following sections of the video series, I will discuss a few results from calculus as well as elementary number theory, which will serve as foundations for our elementary proof of prime number theorem. In this section, we are going to introduce two formal transformations in calculus, which will be useful in general in analytic number theory. And we will summarize them as theorem 421. Suppose that c1, c2, etc. is a sequence of numbers that the function c of t means the summation of c sub n's for n less than or equal to t, and that f of t is any function of t. Then, we have the following summation formula. This formula tells us we can sum up c sub n times f of n for n less than or equal to x in another way. By summing up those c sub n's times the increments in f of n. And there's a remainder term c of x times f of floor of x. So this is our first formal transformation. The second transformation stays as follows. If, in addition, that c sub j is equal to 0 for j less than n1 and f of t has a continuous derivative for t bigger or equal to n1 then the summation can also be written as c of x times f of x minus the integral from n1 to x 
of sieve t times f prime of t dt. And later we're going to refer these two transformations as 22.5.1 and 22.5.2, as are labeled in Hardest book. In literature, these two transformations are often referred to as elbow summation or summation by parts. Although in this video series, I will make it very specific. Whenever we use these two transformations, I will code them directly instead of saying elbow summation or summation by parts. And now let's prove these two transformations. The proof is not hard, but it requires really careful calculation. To prove the first formula, we're gonna rewrite the sum using the definition of C of T's. And now we regroup these terms. And don't forget the last term, c of the floor of x times f of floor of x. But remember, by definition, this guy is simply equal to c of x, by definition. So, this verifies this 22.5.1. This is exactly the right hand side in 22.5.1. And now to see the other transformation, we're going to use Newton Leibniz formula. Or well, the fundamental theorem of calculus. That f of n minus f of n plus 1 is equal to the negative, the integral from n to n plus 1 of f prime of t dt. Remember, in this situation, we assume that f has continuous derivative for t bigger or equal to some n1. And remember, but the definition of C of t, it is equal to C of n for t bigger or equal to n less than n plus 1. So, C of n times f of n minus f of n plus 1 is equal to the integral from n to n plus 1 of c of n times f prime of t dt for n bigger equal to n1. And remember, we assumed that c sub j is 0 for j less than n1. Hence, c of x is equal to 0 for all x less than n1. And therefore, the summation of c sub n, f of n, for n less than equal to x, by 22.5.1 we just proved, this is equal to and now apply the formula we just obtained to this sum. We get
Now putting this sum and this integral together, we get the integral from n1 all the way to x. And that finishes the proof of the second formula. So this is equal to c of x times f of x minus the integral from n1 all the way to x, c of t times f prime of t dt. And that finishes the proof of theorem 421. Now as an immediate application, we probe the following. The sum of 1 over n for n less than equal to x as an estimate log of x plus gamma plus big O of 1 over x, where gamma is a constant known as Euler's constant. So now let's prove this. To prove this, we use the transformation 22.5.2 and put c sub n equal to 1, f sub t equal to 1 over t, and n1 equal to 1. Now by this transformation, what do we get? The left hand side of this formula becomes simply the sum of n for x less than equal to x. Well, the right hand side of it becomes c of x divided by x because f of x is taken as 1 over x plus n1 is 1 and we integrate from 1 to x of c of t divided by t squared dt. And we continue simplifying this. c of x is equal to the floor of x by our definition. And to evaluate this integral, we're going to separate this uh, floor of t as two parts. And compute this integral, which is equal to log of x. And to compute this part, we're going to rewrite this integral as two parts. One part from 1 to infinity, and the other from x to infinity. Because the numerator is bounded by 1, so we get a convergent integral. And let's continue. And uh, separate this uh, floor of x divided by x again into two parts. And now you see there are five things in this sum. We're going to regroup them and put together this one and the integral from one to infinity. Know that this part is actually a negative number because flower of t is less than or equal to t. And the other part now we flip this t and uh, flower of t and subtract x minus floor of x divided by x.
this part because this integral is convergent is a constant and that constant will be the Euler's constant gamma because this integral is negative but at the same time you can see its absolute value is also bounded by 1 by integrating from 1 to infinity of 1 over t squared. This gamma will turn out to be a constant between 0 and 1. But of course, you don't have to know what kind of value this is, because we only need to accept this as a constant. You don't know how big it is. And this part is something that we want to show to be of order 1 over x. And we will denote this part by e, which stands for error. The absolute value of e is bounded about by, now using the triangular inequality, know that this integrand is bounded above by 1 over t squared. So this part of integral is bounded by the integral from x infinity of 1 over t squared dt. And this guy, the absolute value of this guy, is bounded by 1 over x. And they together, if you compute this integral, is also 1 over x. So they together will be 2 over x. Anyway, this e is big O of 1 over x. And we are done with the proof of theorem 422.